Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A warm welcome to the course Sociology of Resource Management. Through this course, I intend to help you all understand the essence of resources, their interaction with the society and the resulting outcome. During the first two weeks, I will introduce you to different kinds of resources and help you situate them in a broader societal context. So let us get started with the first module that is categorizing resources governed under various property regimes. I am sure all of us know what resources are. In fact, in the very moment, we are all using some or the other form of resources. If we go by the definition, then resources are some things that have utility and add value to life. How do we then categorize resources? Resources are categorized either as man-made or natural. And on one hand, we consume resources on a day-to-day -day basis in form of natural resources like the water that we consume, the land that we live on, the forest from where we draw our fodder and food from, they are all naturally occurring. But on the other hand, there are man-made resources like the internet, the medium that we are using to get connected with each other right now and the knowledge that we are sharing through this platform. These have been created by human beings with the help of existing resources. Our interaction with different natural and man-made resources shed light on the production and the consumption of these resources. And when we talk about the production and consumption of the resources, the interesting aspect of ownership comes into the picture. Then we encounter two broad questions like who owns these resources that we want to consume? and who possesses the right or have access to the resources. Before we delve into the questions, we must first decode how do we determine the ownership of these resources. Because the ownership of the resources can further determine who can have rights to use them and who do not have right to use them. This brings us to the concept of property, property rights and property regime. Let us analyze them one by one to gain more clarity on the resource usage. The term property means resources or things that are owned or possessed by individuals or groups having some value. It also signifies certain directives that inform us about the status of ownership and various interrelationships arising out of that property and what rights these statuses grant the owner. For example, a person who owns a house, he or she possesses it, maintains it, determines who can have access to it, as well as establishes in the society that the house belongs to him or her. Further, the right to property um, or the house allows him or her to take specific decisions or act in a certain way with regard to the property in question. Here, rights mean the decision or actions that are allowed at the property user's end. Like which color he or she wants to paint the house and how to decorate it or who are allowed into the house and who are not. However, rights are always accompanied by duties both of which are determined by the rules. Like here, the duty of the owner of the house is to pay taxes to the government for his or her property, not to encroach upon others' property, abide by the rules that are set by the government. And these rules determine the direction that states what actions are allowed and what are not in relation to the property. 
In Daniel Brumley's words, the essence of property rights is a structure of rights and duties that will give any particular benefit stream protection against adverse claims. As having rights over a specific property will prohibit others from claiming the same property. In order to understand the property rights in relation to the resources, in a better way, we need to delve into the concept of de jure and de facto. De jure rights over originated when people or individuals are officially given the rights over a property. These rights are often bestowed by the government whose official entrust the users of the resource with such rights because of its legitimate nature they are naturally secure and hold well in the court of law. Whereas de facto property rights on the other hand are determined and implemented by the resource users themselves. The rights do not have an official or legitimate source making them less secure in nature in comparison to the de jure. These two kinds of property rights often exist together in practice. For instance, in case of a national park, the government has given rights of the forest protection committee the right to access but not the right to withdraw. So, while they are free to enter the forest, they cannot retrieve any part of the forest for their own use and it is a protected site in that case. When we analyze the property regimes, they are created to protect the resources from encroachment. Brumley treats property regimes as systems of authority since rights and duties lie at the very core of it. There is an element of coercion both within and outside the property regime boundary that helps to create or to ensure the adherence of rights and duties by individuals and groups and helps in protecting the property from all kinds of harm. Coercion within property regime are internalized externally as well as internally. The external coercion is to keep outsiders at bay while the internal coercion keeps a check on the over exploitation of the resources by the users and by the community. The decision for which kind of regime is suitable for what kind of a resource is determined by the nature of the natural resource and the intention of the future users of the resources. Initially, it was believed that everything was held in commons, be it a land, pastures, forest, everything. But with the advent of demarcating boundaries between what is mine and what is theirs, that came into the picture when people realized that resources are limited in nature and they have certain values. Before moving on, let us briefly look at the history of property regime at a time when local villages were the basic unit of resource production and consumption. The villagers would be greatly or extremely careful about the resource usage, making sure not to overuse or cross the carrying capacity or the carrying threshold. There are two reasons why the system of resource management broke down. First, due to the emergence of the charismatic leader whose reign transcended the village boundaries, they began to treat these resources as source of profit as opposed to the means of survival for the villagers. As a result, crops and other natural resources began to circulate in the markets with some of the supplies even being exported for generating greater income. And here the linkage of resource with the market began for the first time. Second, with the forces of colonization that severely impeded the authority of the villages, the colonizers were in constant need of money to continue their project and they relied upon the exploitation of the natural resources where they were stationed to accumulate wealth or the capital. The combined capture of power by the local leaders and the colonial rulers gradually rendered 
the reign of village management powerless. And once the colonizers were defeated and the nations began to rise, local sources of authority like the village were still not restored to the former status and in the fear that they would undermine the authority of the central government. Consequently, properties that were earlier controlled under the village management regime and that were managed as commons passed on to the hands of the central government and were re-categorized as state or the public property. This was also the beginning of other property management regimes that we know of today. Having discussed about the concept of property, property rights and property regime, let us now analyze Edela Schelger's and Eleanor Ostrom's work which explained the working of property regime. They have categorized or theorized two tiers of action that people undertake while they engage in their daily activities in relation to properties. The first is at the operational level of action and the second is the collective choice level of action. These two kinds of actions are determined by appropriate rules. Actions of operation nature are guided by rules that correspond at an operational level. An example of operational level rule would be predetermined rules that existed since long time and no one knows who framed it or who is responsible for producing these rules like stating which areas in the village cattle could be grazed and which areas are forbidden for cattle gauging or other uses whereas collective choice rules determine the action undertaken by a collective of people. So, if we go back to the earlier example of collective choice rule, uh, we would be able to change the operational rule specifying the number of ships or cows or cattle that one can gaze in the land, who can use the land and when or etc. Thus operational rules affect the immediate arrangement while the collective choice rules have the potential to shape the future operational rule and the use of the resources. Together the collective choice action and the rules affect the functioning at the operational level. Now that we have discussed or covered the basics of property right, let us take a look at two different types of property rights that come into the picture while dealing with natural resources that are managed by a community. According to Shangler and Ostrom, these are property rights at operational tire. Property rights at the collective choice tire, under the operational tire there are two further kinds of rights like access and withdrawal. To have access rights means entitled to enter or permitted to access a particular tangible property. For example, if you have a club membership, then you only will be able or entitled to enter the club as you have the access right, whereas withdrawal rights enables one to procure resources from a given property. For example, in order to draw water from a well in the village, you must have the withdrawal rights. Everyone is not allowed to draw water from the well and also some are given these special rights. So, it happens in some villages which are also uh, you know this distinction is based on caste or other criteria. So, who then is the authority to decide the collective choice rights an individual or a group has? In order to understand this we have to refer to Shangler and Ostrom and they consider that the management rights, exclusion rights and the alienation rights together make up the collective choice rights in case of managing a resource. Here the management rights enable the right holder the right to control the internal rules of usage of a resource and to make changes in it for its betterment. Management rights holder also have right to decide who can procure the resource in what ways that is they formulate the withdrawal rights at the operational tire. For example, we all know that for the smooth functioning of a cricket team, there is a managing body. 
which decides which players can play the match and in what order. Similarly, here the management rights holder determine the rules of the resource use. To have exclusion rights means to be able to decide who has the right to enter the property in what ways and can that right be passed over to somebody else. Holders of exclusion right get to conceive the criteria that individuals or groups should meet to create a property. For example, you must have seen instructions where to enter a property you must be of a certain age group like the children's play area. Here the holders of exclusion rights determine the age group and the rules of transfer of membership as well. Finally, the alienation rights are the rights to put on sale, rent, the first two rights that is one's management right and one's exclusion right. Alienation rights are the final in nature which means once they have been exercised the holders of the right loses the right to exercise it in the future. Shangler and Ostrom researched in the areas of fisheries, namely the lobster industry of Maine and were able to identify four sections of property rights holders, namely the authorized users, the claimants, the proprietors and finally the owners. The table here uh, represents how owners claimant, proprietor and authorized users have access and withdrawal rights. Here owners, claimant, proprietor have management rights whereas owners and proprietor have exclusion rights and the owners alone have the alienation right. Hence owners of a resource enjoy all the rights associated with the management of a resource. Finally, the owners have all the rights at both the tires. This means they have access as well as withdrawal rights at the operational tire and rights of management and exclusion as well as alienation at the collective choice tire. Having discussed the property rights and different rights associated with it, let us examine the natural resources and their governance. Natural resources can be managed as public property, private property, commons and as free access or unregulated property. Though the distinction is not watertight always, we might encounter some resources which have some or the other feature from each domain. We will try to specify the resources through property rights that govern them, their ownership and usage to make it clearer to all of you. Now I will talk about the first kind of property which is the straight property or the public property. As the meaning of the word suggests these resources concern people as the whole and are open to all. Some researchers have noted that public resources are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Since no one can be excluded there is no conflict over them. However, they are always not free to all. Anyone who wants to have access to it must abide by the rules and certain rules that are set by the governing authority or who are generally the enforcing authority of the state. This means that the owners of the resource is not same as the possible users. For example, the public parks, no, anyone can access them but they must follow certain rules that are determined by the municipality of that area where the park is situated like one can only access the park during the operational hours, should not loiter in the park, pluck any flowers from it or destroy any benches that are placed within the park. If anyone engages in such activities, then they might be restricted from accessing the park. Other example of public or the state property are the airports and railway platforms. In both the cases, gaining access requires payment of a certain type or of certain amount. For airports, a hefty parking fee has to be paid for gaining access to the airport for the use of the parking lot. Moreover, only people with valid flight tickets can enter the departure terminal. Others are only allowed to sit in the waiting areas. 
In case of railway platforms, a platform ticket has to be purchased to enter the station without a valid journey ticket. So, here the access is regulated by the state appointed agents such as police officials or security personnel. Sometimes the government also outsources the governing process to private firms or agencies on a contractual basis. For example, there are several national parks throughout India which require the users to pay an entry fee for or to avail the jungle safari. The responsibility of the fee collection in this case the kiosk as well as the safari vehicles have been transferred to members of the forest protection committee under the joint forest management program. Villagers who act as members of the forest protection committee are also responsible for protecting, managing the forest and saving them. These properties which are public in nature are open to all but not free always. As James Cooligan states, in theory public still means people but in practice public means the government. There have also been instances where public or the state property being converted into the different or other forms of property and vice versa. For example, there are land auctions through which the Indian state or the central government sells public land to private builders or private buyers or residentials for business purposes. So, public property does not mean that they will always remain as a public property. Let us now discuss the next type that is the private property. As the meaning of the word suggests, these resources belong to or can be used by a particular person, community or a group. According to Toffler MacDonnell, the four basic characteristics attributed to this kind of a property are excludability, user privilege. According to Toffler MacDonnell, the four basic characteristics attributed to this kind of a property are excludability, user privilege, controllability and transferability. Private properties are excludable meaning the owners can restrict others from using these personal assets. User privilege refers to the ability of the owners to exclusively derive benefits from their private property. Private property is accom accompanied by the aspect of controllability which allows the owner to act upon their property for various reasons. Finally, the transfer rights enables the owner to sell their private property or put them on rent as they will. For example, the things that I own like for example, my watch you know which I am wearing is my private property. The laptop that you are using is your private property. The pen that you are holding in your hand or the book that you have in your bookshelf are all your private property if you own them. Similarly, individuals or multiple families might own a patch of land, house or immovable resources as the private property. Restricting is use access to only a few or certain individuals. Sometimes private property may take the shape of a public space and allow uninhabited movement of the people. Take uh, for example your favorite store or a shopping mall. You are welcome to visit it anytime that you want as per the schedule timing and use it for your personal interest like buying products from it. However, it is still owned by a private company or an individual or a corporate chain. The products will become yours only when you pay for them and hence the transfer of rights over the product takes place. Here the shop owner who had earlier the right over the resources transfers the right to you once you buy them. But the shop which you could freely access for your interest in this case is not a public property even though it appears in the first instance that it is a public property. Here it is worth mentioning that the government sometimes has the authority to withhold private property in case private property is obstructing the access of a public property or in other cases where the private property has been obtained 
through illegal means. We are all familiar with the sight of the shops and the houses being bulldozed to allow the extension of public roads or to accommodate the increasing flow of traffic. Let us consider another case. As the citizens of India, we all have to uh, declare our assets once a year and pay our taxes. The income tax department keeps a record of every citizen earning and their income to the tax ratio and has the authority to seize the private property if all the sources of income have not been legitimately declared. The advantage of private property over other properties is that because of its excludability nature, it is less pressure, it creates less pressure on the resources and they remain in a better condition. Under the private property also resides an interesting category of intellectual resources born out of the human mind. This we will discuss in detail in the course later. The third kind of property or the commons are a particular kind of institutional arrangement for governing the use and disposition of resources. Under the Roman law, common property were referred to as res communis. Here community, group or a particular individual does not have the ownership over the resources and mostly commons are owned by the government, state, but the community and the group are the custodians of the resources in this case. They govern the resource, they decide the resource use for managing the resource. This also means that commons are free from restrictions that market poses. Here you might be confused between the public resources and the commons. Let me clarify it a bit. Commons unlike public resources are not openly accessible to all. For example, let us imagine a village pond which is again situated in a X village. Being situated in a X village, it can only be accessed by the villagers who live in the X village. Thus, it is limited access resource by its nature or physicality. This means only residents of the village can consume the benefits. Again, everyone cannot draw from the village point according to his or her desire. He or she has to follow certain rules that are set up by the community, determining its usage and the predetermined rules. Like what amount of water can be drawn by the each household on an everyday basis and how to determine the sequence of water drawing from the pond. These rules are important to avoid the over exploitation of the resources or the water in the pond in this case and again to conserve them for the future generation. Since these resources are limited in nature, their management plays an important role. So, if the pond has limited number of fishes in it, then overfishing will prevent the fishes from breeding normally, causing the fishes to become extinct over a period of time. However, in the last few decades, scholars have reflected how large corporates have started seizing various kinds of common resources for the purpose of profit making. This phenomenon has been termed as enclosure of the commons. The issue for those being disposed is one of survival. In the words of Donald Nonini, as a result, communities that depend on such commons are putting up a strong fight to resist these kinds of enclosure, giving these resources a social character. We will also discuss about this in detail in the coming modules. Finally, we come to the discussion of res nullius. Romans call it for free access property. Here the term property is a misnomer as the resource does not really belong to anyone, making it a fertile ground for several competing parties. For example, animal living in the forest are no one's property until they get killed by a hunter and used by them. The first hunter to slay a tiger or a deer for instance will have the claim over the animal. Free access property often emerge from the remnants of one's restricted access property. The former often fall into ruin due to years of mismanagement and gradually turn to open access. An example of this would be de jure property that has been sanctioned by the government 
but never used for any purpose like a piece of land. Since it has not been used for a, over a period of time, there will be an overgrowth a growth of the shrubs and grasses on the land. Eventually, this abundant piece of land will be used as a de facto property by the cattle owners who, who lead their herds to such lands for gazing. After having a detailed discussion on different property rights, let us examine the different types of common resources. Since we will be studying common resources in uh, detail over a period of time or coming weeks, it is important examining the resources for better understanding. Yoshai Benkler has divided common resources into two criteria. The first criterion is whether common resources are open access or limited access. The space is an example of open access commons. It is open to all human beings on earth to explore and the village pond that I talked about earlier is an example of limited access commons where the usage is restricted. When there is a grave mismanagement of resources or complete absence of rules and duties regarding the protection of the natural resource, then a common property gets converted into free access property. The second criterion is whether the common resource is governed or ungoverned. Most common resources are governed using informal or formal rules. Sometimes the rules are not structured or easily identifiable making it look like an unmanaged resource. This usually happens in case of open access commons like the space. Any country that has financial and technological means can send their representatives to the space, but they have to abide by certain rules that are led by the United Nations Committee on the peaceful usage of the outer space. Common resources have also been identified according to the nature of the resource in question. Keeping the criterion in mind, Nonini has divided commons into four types. They are natural resource commons, the social commons, the intellectual cultural commons and the species commons. Now I will briefly focus on each of these kinds and make things clearer for you. The first type is the natural resource commons. These are the commons that have developed around the environment based resources which get degraded over a period of time and are both renewable and non-renewable in nature. Renewable natural resources include the forest, the water bodies, land, fishery and so on, which can be replenished through the natural processes of production. Examples of non-renewable resources are fossil fuels, which are not replenished at the same rate as consumption. Thus, natural resource commons suffer from the problem of rivalry and subtractability. Imagine that there are two fishermen trying to fish from a same common pond. Each one will have or will want to have or keep the best catches for themselves and their relationship with each other then will be nothing or anything but friendly. As the problem here of rivalry exists, so one person use will always affect the other person's use. Natural resource commons are further divided into two types. The first type revolves around resources which not only get exhausted but cannot be renewed such as species of birds or animals that get extinct due to hunting over a period of time. The second type of natural resource commons involves resources that get exhausted but can be renewed like the river, the forested area, the agricultural land, pastures, these are all the type of commons where they can be renewed over a period of time. It is within the commons regime that there is a possibility for renewal of the mentioned resources contrary to the private or the public property regime. Nonini's second category of commons are the social commons. These revolve around resources of social in nature that are generated out of labor undertaken by the human beings. Examples of this would include caregiving jobs and other civil jobs like maintaining cleanliness, providing security and so on. 
Such resources are limited and the rival in nature since one individual can engage in only one particular activity at a particular given point of time. So, if a nurse is attending to a patient or a sick person, their services will not be available to other sick persons at the same time and imagine a situation that the world faced during the COVID-19 pandemic when we were short of doctors and nurses or of the social commons. The situation however improves when more individual participate in generating the social resources or the social commons. This will require enough number of nurses to be able to cater to the needs of all sick people. This will require some social commons resources also have positive outcome thereby reducing the pressure on such resources. If adequate cleanliness and hygiene is maintained by the users of social commons resources in a given community that there are chances that less number of individual will be susceptible to diseases. This will help decrease the amount of burden on the caregiving resources at a given point of time like the decrease in the COVID cases due to the use of mask and maintaining proper hygiene. Intellectual commons on the other hand are resources that are born out of human mind whereas cultural resources or cultural commons are the resources that are cultural in nature. They together are classified as the third type of commons intellectual and cultural commons. Together they encompass the scientific discoveries and theories, technological advancement, creative products, skills that are required to produce them. Unlike the type of common resources I discussed earlier, intellectual and cultural commons are non-rival in nature. In fact, the more the number of users engaged in the production, the better the sustainability of the commons. Let us consider the case or a following example. All of us sitting in different corners of the country can choose to watch the same movie or listen to the same song at the very moment without interfering with each other's experience in any way. In fact, doing so will enhance the popularity of the movie and ensure its future circulation. So, one's person use do not affect the other person use in this case. These commons are non-rival but they also have unlimited accommodating power. Species commons is the fourth type of common or the final type of common that Nonini categorized. These common revolve around biological attributes of human beings such as the body parts, the organs, the gene information and so on. Since the removal or theft of these resources could lead to irrevocable changes or damages to the aggrieved human being, any kind of profit oriented activity around them is banned. Thus, the users of such commons come together to ensure the protection of these resources from the clutches of the market. Most of you must have heard of illegal human trafficking or illegal human trafficking king rackets through which women and children are transported forcefully for the purpose of exploitation. The organizations that are born out of the need to protest such crime qualify as species common. In India an example of NGO that prevents to work or that works to prevent this human trafficking and rehabilitate the victim is Shakti Bahini working at uh, New Delhi. So, till now if you see I have discussed the different types of property regime, how they work especially with reference to the natural resources. The last part of this session we, I will give you a brief overview of how policy framework of various governments all over the world are shaping the area of the study. I will talk particularly about the recent tendency seen among governmental organizations to delicate management and governance of natural resources as studied by uh, Mackenzie Dick and Anna Cox. 
they identified four policy framework through which the transference generally occurs. They are deconcentration, decentralization, devolution and privatization. Under deconcentration, the power to make decision is transferred to the lower ranks of the government which itself ultimately remains accountable for the resources. In decentralization, the government transfers both the power to make administrative and financial decisions to the lower rung. The combined authority also helps in strengthening the local bodies in the vicinity of the resource. Devolution which, uh, which Menzing and Knox especially focus on involves programs that shift responsibility and authority from the state to non-governmental bodies. When the power to control the resources is almost completely transferred to the local users of the resource, the arrangement is known as community based resource management or CBRM. When the government retains a considerable larger role after the transfer of certain amount of control to other users, we have joint management system. Finally, there is privatization which involves the passage of power from the government to private bodies or individuals. Private companies and non-governmental organizations are examples of such bodies. The common thread tying this policy reform is that of what has been termed as subsidiarity by Doring and defined as the transfer of property to the lowest appropriate level. Deconcentration and decentralization are vertical forms of subsidiarity while transfer of power to non-governmental bodies are horizontal form of subsidiarity. I will conclude this session by discussing reasons put forward by Mackenzie and Knox for why such transference of power is happening. First, due to the inability of the government in effectively governing the resources at the local level. The government is not simply responsible for framing rules. It also must be successfully implementing them. The local bodies are seen however better at this job because of their nearness to the resource and their dependence on it. Second, the will to involve local people in the management of the resources strengthens the spirit of democracy and puts the power back into the hands of people who are actually affected by the resources. Finally, the delegation of power to the local bodies reduces the financial burden that is already present on the government which would otherwise have to pay the salary to all its official in charge of managing the natural resource at the local level. These policy reforms suggest how the discourse of resource management is gradually moving towards a bottom-up approach where the immediate resource users are gaining greater control over the resources and in turn protecting them from rapid overexploitation or depletion. You will learn about this further in the next session and I will talk about common pool resources, what they are and how they are managed. Thank you for listening and have a great day ahead.